Lord, we come before you. We come into your holy presence. We're in your holy presence, but we just feel like as, as we think about it, we kind of come to you. Uh, we're able to approach you in the holy place uh, where we were not permitted before the coming and the blood the shed blood of Jesus, but now we can come to you directly through, the, through Jesus. And, and so we come to you eager to be refreshed, to be enlightened. Uh, and, and we pray, Lord, that you would come to us, not just for our own comfort, but to teach us so many things and to help us live better lives and to serve you better. This, Lord, is a weekend when we annually remember those who died and, and suffered the loss of friends and family some, I, I guess, maybe 89 years ago, more or less. Um, we celebrate this morning those who survived, and we have known some of those people, and we grieve for those who lost their lives. And we thank you, Lord, for watching over all of them and uh, us having the privilege of knowing some of those wonderful people. You, Lord, are the one and the, the only one that can heal broken, the broken spirit, the broken heart, and, and mend us in, in the ways that we need to be mended and change us. Therefore, Lord, we petition heaven this morning, believing by faith that your grace is sufficient to respond to every need that we lay at your feet this morning. And there are among this congregation, I'm sure, many needs, some that we say nothing about, some that we keep inside, but uh, minister to every need that's represented in this place this morning and uh, for those special needs that we pray for from some that have had surgeries this week and others that are in other places. Um, forgive us for any sin or any selfish act that would diminish our ability to come into your presence, diminish our ability to, to represent you well. You know before the foundation, you knew us, uh, you knew before we were ever created before the foundation of the world that we would fail you and we would run from you and we would sometimes disobey you and predictably many of our prayers would, well, they would just fall short of all of the, the prayers and, and the, the needs that we, we would bring before you. Yet, the, the foreknowledge that you had doesn't make, us, make you love us less. So we thank you, Father, for the grace that you offer to us. We thank you that we know that you are present here today. We thank you, Father, for your loving kindness and for your faithfulness. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world. We pray for our families. We pray for our close friends. We pray, oh God, that you would help us, that we might make a difference in, in life and in our society. Meet the special needs now. All the names that are represented here uh, that are on our prayer list and in our hope chest that we pray for and that we lift. We love you now. We thank you for your faithfulness and we ask that you hear us as we pray the prayer of our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sleep. Land where my father died, land of the pilgrim's heart, of every mountain set, their freedom
As I can remember, I have been a church person. How many of you were raised in the church? Some of you probably weren't. Okay. A lot of you were in one church or another. Um, we didn't have children's church, so uh, at least in our church, and uh, not for a long time. So I sat with my parents, and I could draw ships, really, really nice ships, had cargo holes and everything, and boats. I drew boats, probably sit right over here about where Faye is, where my dad and mom would sit, and uh, planes. I, I, I was a good, I liked planes. Vought F, I think it's F-U-4, F-4-U, I believe, uh, uh, Corsair, and then the, um, the Grumman Hellcat. Hellcat, yeah. Anyway, they look a lot alike, so that was the ones that I usually drew, just kind of like that with a little dome, and uh, pretty good, pretty good at that, never... Got professional with it, but uh, did it a lot on, on, the, on the few. And on Sunday evening, we would attend service, because we had th service three times a week, you know. We were going to be there every Sunday, according to my mom and dad. And, and uh, so I slept quite a bit on Sunday night on the pew. But, you know, we try our best to have children's programs and so forth, and I like that, and I wish we had the children to do that with. But honestly, I have good memories of listening out of one ear to the preacher. And, you know, when an evangelist was come in, sometime they were kind of funny, and I would actually wake up and listen. And I uh, have good memories of those sort of things. Camp meeting with, the, with my mom and dad and thousands of people there, and there I sit in this, you know, in the pew, not really thinking it was a bad deal, although I'd rather be outside of the, the building. And uh, I remember going, you've heard me say, going with my father to uh, the church be for service before well, before the service, maybe on a Wednesday night, he would go to the church. No one's there. He would go to a classroom, turn the light out if it was on, and he'd get on his knees and pray. He'd be the only one in the church, and I'd be there with him, probably not praying, just thinking, here I am. You know, Mom, Mom didn't want to keep me, so Dad took me, and uh, it was a good memory. So I met my wife at church camp. Uh, I never had any earthly thought that I would ever be a minister. That was the last thing in my mind. If there was any debate, it was regarding whether I was going to go to church on a regular basis at all. I just noticed uh, this week that my Sunday school teacher, Velma, who you've heard me talk about, was going to be, she's going to be 100 in about two months. So I have two friends that were in that particular church that uh, are going to hit 100 in the next couple of months. 
And she's the one that would call on Saturday morning. And uh, my mother would answer the phone and say, hello. Oh, good morning, Velma. And at that point, I would go. And mom would say, yes, he's here. Just a moment, please. <laughs> and then she would invite me to church. I, I, I mean, I appreciate that now, but at the time, I didn't want to talk to Velma. I don't want to go to church. So, anyway. Uh, with that history, I have a pretty fair understanding of the church uh, and religion and, and the life of a pastor, and my wife even more because her she was a pastor's daughter, PK, and uh, that's why she swore she would never be married to a pastor, but <laughs> I wasn't a pastor when we got married. So anyway, as time passes, I begin to understand that ministers and clergymen and priests have a responsibility to be up. What do you mean up? To be an encourager, to be people people. A lot of them aren't, but that's what we're called to do. In fact, Christians have that responsibility. If you're a negative person, then you go work for, I don't know, work for animal control, euthanizing dogs and cats. That's not a fun thing. Or go work for MSNBC or CNN. And if your favorite book of the Bible is Lamentations, then you might consider, you know, a return clerk at Walmart or the IRS or something. I do have friends in the IRS. I shouldn't say that. But most people don't want to come to church and listen to a pastoral catharsis. Pastors have a responsibility to be up. And Christians also. Now, I'm not saying you need to be artificial and fake all the time, and you feel bad, but you just run around with joy on your face. It's not real, but it can be real in Christ. So, for the most part, I've enjoyed being a pastor, and I love to preach if I feel like I'm really helping someone, and if I feel like I'm encouraging someone, or maybe I'm not boring someone, or at least I'm helping someone find the Lord, because that's really what it's all about, to be a Christian, not a pastor, a Christian. However, like many of you, I face some really grim days and dark days, and when I say that, then you begin to think, yeah, I remember that day, and I remember this time. Uh, at, at the death of a close friend. Uh, in fact, I've lost a former prisoner this week, as well as a former co-worker, a girl that I thought, I'm going to stop and see her when I go to Panama City one of these days, because I haven't seen her in a long time. And Well, I hope I see her in heaven. Family member, neighbor, co-worker. Financial loss, disappointments, failure, because we all have failure, I think, regrets, deep sorrow. In one of my churches, we had four murders connected to the church. One was just before I was on staff, it was before I was on staff, but uh, death by suicide. That's not just, hap that's not just the you know, the individual that's involved or the one that took their own life, but there's a whole group of people that are hurt and dealing with those kinds of things. And uh, one of those hits, I think, was a mafia hit. Made one of the guys on my staff real nervous about, you know, I'm, I didn't think much about it, but it did him. Like, well, they may be, we may know too much. So you can't connect to church people, and all of these people feel pain. In fact, everybody feels pain at one time or another. This is the church that Jesus said, I will build. I will build my, my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I've served in churches and I've served districts. I've never served on the denominational level of leadership, but sadly, serving in high places in, church, in Christ's church does not make you a good person. It doesn't make you a wise person. It doesn't even make you Christ-like. I know that firsthand. And I understand being in the church and being hurt by the church, why so many people don't like the church that are outside the church, because they've been hurt and they've been manipulated. So, so people will hurt you, and even church people will hurt you. And guess what? Even Christians will hurt you, because there are a lot of church people that are not Christians. Never ask Jesus Christ to come into their life. They go to church because it's it feels good, or it's the right thing to do, but they don't know God. So, as Christ follower, you have the responsibility to be up. In Philippians 2, 4, it says, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. That's what we're called to do. Do unto others as you would have them 
do unto you. That's a mouthful. We can say it easily, but that says a lot. There have been times in my life when there was great pain, and I felt abandoned, and life wasn't fair, so I described myself in those days as being without a song, S-O-N-G, a song. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. If you have a song, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Let me read a little bit from uh, Psalm 40, verse 1. Now think about this. If you're going through a really tough time, or you have, or you do, and you're looking for help, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. And he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud, and out of the mire, and he set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand, and he put a new song in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God. Well, that's nice. It's interesting, though, there's more there. It's interesting how others will respond to God's song. If they see that you're going through a difficult time, but you handle it fairly well, and you trust God, and you come out on the other side victorious, then you add this verse, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's the next verse. After all that, you bring people to salvation. Now, when you're down, when you're not up, allow Christ to give you a song. What's a song? Well, I wasn't even sure what I meant by a song. I just knew how I felt. A song would be new hope. It would be faith. It would be believing in the promises of God. Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett and others sang a particular song, but I like the way Willie Nelson really nailed it. And it doesn't, it's not quite on track, but it just it really spoke to me anyway. Without a song, the day will never end. Without a song, the road will never bend. When things go wrong, when things go wrong, a man ain't got a friend without a song. I'll never know what makes the rain to fall. I'll never know what makes the grass so tall. I only know there ain't no love at all without a song because there's only, love is, comes only from one place, and that's God. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the world will tell you that it's all nonsense, but after you've lived as long as I have and seen the miracles of God in your life and in other people's lives, silly. Let me pay attention to those people. There are a variety of passages in the Bible about the song God puts in your heart, so he builds his church. In Psalm 118, 13 and 14, says, I was pushed back, I was about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. In Psalm 96 and 98, both begin with sing to the Lord a new song. In Ephesians 5, 19, it enlarges on this, speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, what are psalms? Well, psalms are inspired songs from the Bible. Uh, they're sang by the Hebrew children. They're all sang sometimes, but we sing them as well. Hymns, reciting doctrinal truth as, as a worship and expressing our faith. And then spiritual songs, I believe, are inspired music, both personal and worship. Sometimes you sing them at home, sometimes at church, sometimes you make them up, sometimes the Holy Spirit gives them to you. It's praise. I remember having an epiphany, you know, I, when I, after the fact, sometimes you're able to see how God was showing you things when you sort of knew it, but we all are skeptical a little bit sometimes, and I remember having an epiphany several years ago, a storm is coming. I'm not into all that prophecy stuff, but a storm is coming. I saw the dark clouds over the church. I saw it literally, and I saw it prophetically. I saw it with my own eyes. And the song that came to mind afterwards that really spoke to my heart, and you may not know it, but it was a song by Mosey Lister. And it suddenly began to take deep meaning for me, and you've heard me talk about it. In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face, while the storms howl about me and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by. The second verse, Many times Satan whispered, There is no need to try, for there's no end of sorrow 
and there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storms never darken the sky till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of your hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Well, you know, you can listen to that. It doesn't mean a thing until you hit the storm. And then suddenly, oh, I need to remember that song or those words. Frank Bottom wrote a song entitled, The Comforter Has Come. I don't think it's in our hymnal, but we used to sing it years ago. I never listened to the words at all when I was a kid. I sort of mumbled through it. And then one day when I was really hurting, I heard Jars of Clay sing it, and I got to that second verse, and I was about to get through that long, long night, but I didn't know the words were there, and it says, the long, long night is past, the morning breaks at last, and hush the dreadful wail and the fury of the blast, as o'er the golden hills the day advances fast, the comforter has come. I don't know if you know that song or not. Discouragement. And yet God sends the comforter, which is what? The Holy Spirit. And he builds his church. You remember Elijah, all blood and fire and rain, the Terminator on Sunday, but Jezebel made an appointment first thing on Monday morning. Now, I've had very few days when Jezebel or Alexander the coppersmith quenched my anointing. But I've had a few. There have been disappointments. There have been times when friends disappeared and they disappointed me. Or they were silent at best. Oh, you too, huh? Yeah, we've all had friends like that. But in the dark days of the church, there are five words that give us hope. In fact, a promissory note from God. Jesus spoke uh, really them first to St. Peter, and they're just this. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. In Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This text is a lifesaver. It is a guarantee that there will always be the church, even though for centuries they've been trying to tear the church down. They're trying to do it today. They're never going to tear the church down. It's, it'll, it lives forever. He will build his church. Whether we help or not, he builds the church. You just read the essential confession of the church. You are the Christ, the Son of God. I'm thinking about all the revivals that are breaking out. I know it's Texas A&M. Baptisms of the students. Uh, they've got the professors in the classrooms that are telling you they're no God, and it's all nonsense, but they know better. And we're seeing revival all over this country ever since Asbury, and Asbury is also having big baptisms, and it's happened on college campuses. It's amazing. And God is at work right now in this country. It's a, it's, it's, it's a coin flip. We're just about to sink or swim in this country. And we'll just leave it at that. We're called not just the pastor, not just the pastor, but me, all of us, proclaim the essential confession of the church, that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Jesus the historical figure. They like to talk about that. Not Jesus the noble character. It's all right to talk about that. He is the Christ, the King. He is our intercessor. He is the grace giver. He is present when two or three people are gathered in his name. He is the only way to the Father, and he's the only hope of the world. And that truth is, of course, under attack. Uh, post-Christian culture. To believe in one God who is exclusively revealed in the person of Jesus Christ is politically incorrect, but it has been for a long time. Much of Hollywood has cast him as a misguided mystic, although now you begin to see people in Hollywood are even beginning to step up to the plate, start their own companies, and so forth. Some of them believe just simply that he's not non-existent. Uh, Harvard Dons have reduced him as an historical footnote, even though Harvard was founded by a clergyman, and it's named after a clergyman. It was founded for the clergy, 
Liberal theologians have denied his deity. They disclaim his word. 40% of Americans believe all religions teach equally valid truth, which is, of course, not true. 53% believe all people pray to the same God. If you invoke a higher power or you call for respectful moments of silence, America will collectively bow in reverence. But if you introduce the name of Jesus, you might be censored. One of the things that really surprised me, I thought people that went to the Grand Ole Opera were, were pretty much country folk that, that loved Jesus. But it, you, you cannot use the name of Jesus in a song in the Grand Ole Opera, even though uh, Vince Gill doesn't let that bother him. He just does it anyway, bless his heart. There seems to be some confusion and heresy in the rank and file, even of the American church. The message of Christ is marginalized in our culture, even in our churches, as we've seen over the last few years. Truth was made, I think, abundantly clear in the aftermath of 9-1-1. On September the 23rd at Yankee Stadium, the mayor of New York called a special gathering, built a prayer for America. Was the good motive? I suppose it was, but the stage was cluttered with religious and non-religious, everything that you can imagine. A pagan blessing, that's we need a pagan blessing, a Baha blessing, a Baha prayer, a Buddhist prayer, a secular reflection, Hindu prayers, plural, Jewish prayers, plural, Muslim prayer, Sikh prayer, spiritual reflection, and then Beth Midler came out and served up a worship music. She's saying, you are the wind beneath my wing. Well, that's all right, but I think I could have done better in choosing the person and the song. Opal Renfrey, who I used to like and now I do not like, as far as a person, boldly proclaims that all who lost their lives on 911 were immediately added to heaven's spiritual roster of angels. I wonder where she went to seminary. Sure wasn't any place that I know anything about. I, don't, I never heard about angel, you know, people going to heaven turning into angels. That's something children do talk about. James Earl Jones, I love his voice, deep voice, but he gave a little bit of hope when he thundered, we have come to reaffirm our faith. Now, that's good. I like that. And then he finished with, we have come to reaffirm our faith in human dignity. Oh, well, that's good, but that's not good enough. Oh, yes, there were some Christian prayers offered, but only one mentioned the name of the one who died on the cross for humanity. That was Bishop T.D. Jakes. I like Bishop. I think he died, didn't he? Didn't he pass away? I believe maybe he did. And he just closed with, In Jesus' name we pray. I like to try to preach like him, but I can't. <laughs> He's a great black pastor. I think he passed away. You see, what twisted irony, the one who conquered death is barely welcome at the funeral of America. We need hope, we need grace, we need comfort, but the comforter, he didn't get invited. Not at all. We may not be welcome in our, he, he might not be welcome in our culture, but he's needed in our culture. We exist to fellowship with and exalt Jesus. Now, I know that we're all, you know, we all know what we believe. We don't all agree. We don't all believe the same. But so many people now want to come into our country, but they don't want Jesus, and they want to change everything. Of course, they want us to ultimately be communist, socialist, and then communist. So everybody wants to come to America. There must, have been a, there must be a reason for that, because this is, this is the closest thing to the children of Israel, and we're acting like the children of Israel now too, up, down, spiritual, not so spiritual, but we were destined to be the country that we are, but we are now turning away from God. And like I said, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but I will build my church. The growth of the church is inevitable. Don't stress. Don't be too... Ver I do stress. I'm sorry. But let's not stress and be anxious. Be obedient and faithful servant. Pray. Commune with God. Be on God's team as he builds his church. Matthew 16. Artists depict um, Jesus with a lamb, or a staff, or a halo, or a first mate on a boat. Oh, well, that's good. You ever seen Jesus depicted with blueprints and a hard hat? He oversees church growth. He oversees Bible studies. He oversees building projects. He's, he surveyed the repair after Irma and other... other uh, storms and so forth that we've faced. He, over, he, he gave oversight to the handicapped restrooms that are there and the ramp and the carpet and the door. He holds the blueprint 
for the rice and beans that we support, the orphans in Myanmar, the orphans in, in Bangladesh, the Blue Water Surrender, the children at Residing Hope, which is now the name of our children's, what we uh, send money to, they're the children. He is the master builder. Have you considered how he labors over the church to build according to his design, his perfect planning, his uninterrupted supply of power, his power for us to complete the task? Have you ever seen Jesus, master builder, with a hard hat and a blueprint in his hand, looking over your neighborhood? The Bible only records two times when Jesus is crying and he's weeping. And one of them, he's weeping over Jerusalem. And in both, he's weeping over people. Always over people. He weeps for this community. He weeps for your neighborhood. He weeps for America. Building is always costly. We know that, don't we? It costs time and energy and money and mental stress. And if it were not for the strength and the renewal that God had promised, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, who could do it? We couldn't do it. I'm amazed sometimes at things that we're able to do, and I know it's only because of God, and sometimes we think we do it on our own. We think, we think uh, somehow we provided the resources or the strength. You see, it's easy to tear down. I have a friend who does that literally. But I'm talking about a different kind of tearing down. Someone like that, I mean, you know somebody that has that gift? I mean, instead of building up, they cause friction or they gossip or they create disharmony. I don't think there's a lot of that going on here, but sometimes church splits. You know, the monkey with a match can destroy more in one hour than a, a thousand wise men could build in a year. I've heard that said. Mrs. O'Leary and her cow, she had five cows, by the way, were exonerated from all blame for the great Chicago fire. Apparently it did start in her barn. I don't know the story, really. It quickly left 100,000 people homeless. It's easy to destroy. It's easy to tear down. In fact, in the church, you don't need a match or a wrecking ball to destroy things. Really, sometimes you just need to do nothing. God is not stopping not slowing down, not changing his plan. The church is truly invincible. The church will never die. The same thing with the Bible. It sold so many more Bibles than any other book that was ever written. There's a reason for that. It's immortal. So, through all manner of evil, and, and, and Satan has attempted to destroy the people of God, because, uh, because of temptation, nations of the world are swimming in a cesspool of filth. They're starving, they're hungry, they're killing each other. Because of evil, Venezuela is now broken. Tyrants have tried to wipe the church off the map. Christianity has been outlawed. And we're facing those kind of things today. But God has put within his people this divine, holy, stubborn streak that causes us to rise up and say, you can't have the church because... There's power available in the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So out of the ashes and the chaos of genocide in Rwanda, a church arises. And 70 years of denial couldn't erase God from the Russian psyche, even though they were taught over and over there is no God. Brezhnev's widow, if you remember, with her forefinger traced the sign of the cross on her dead husband as he lay in the casket who didn't, neither of them supposed to believe in God. The underground church in China is flourishing. Maybe enough to finally, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Every empire that has set out to, to crush the church has failed. Every philosophy, every philosopher that predicted the demise of the church has been wrong. Every ideology that ignores the Bible finds that they're, they're, it is a sustaining truth. Theologian Karl Barth could have been preaching to our generation when he said, the world that we confront today is aggressively pagan. There are influences that daily surround us, influences that influence even the church. In fact, when it begins to influence the church, that's when we're all in trouble. But the culture will not prevail. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What's the church? Well, it's not the Methodist or the Catholic or the this or this or this. It's the person who said, I believe in you, Jesus. Forgive me for my sins, and I invite you into my heart and into my life right now. 
and then begin to live as a disciple, having done all that Jesus asked you to do. So his covenant endures, and his church will ultimately declare the glory, his glory. He's the master builder. He's also a rebuilder. He rebuilds lives. He rebuilds families. He rebuilds churches. And he can rebuild this country. He will do what he does. He is God. All I can do is pray and hope that God's will is that he finds enough believers and enough Christians in this world, in this country, to keep us going straight ahead. We're going to, take, we're going to share in communion this morning um, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Commit or recommit your life to Jesus. If you need to do that, he needs co-workers. He needs workers. I call it FH, FSH construction. I need to get on that team. That's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit construction company. So <laughs> if you're not on the work crew and you're not on the team, just right now invite Jesus as we pray the prayer of uh, confession before we take communion. Just pray that uh, you become one of his. I've, we've done that a little different again today for various reasons. One, uh, of course, I was gone and Gail is not with us, and we, but uh, we'll use these this morning. If you didn't pick one up, uh, just raise your hand and uh, our friend here will bring you a, a, a cup for communion. Our, Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. We invite anyone that's watching to join with us. As a matter of fact, if, if you don't have bread in your hand, you can always turn this off and go get it. <laughs> a little different than it is here. Will you stand with me with your... With your uh, bulletin and let's read the prayer of confession and thanksgiving and then we'll in fact I think I'll have you to sit down after we do the thanksgiving or the confession let's pray together pour out your Holy Spirit on all gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine hear our words of confession forgive us dear God shine upon us with the light of your mercy by your spirit make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Amen. I want you to read with me, but you may be seated now. We'll continue to read and then take the communion together. In fact, I think I'll go ahead and open the bread. Let's read. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread. Gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. God bless you. Let's stand together. As Jesus gave himself fully and completely, may we give ourselves fully and completely. And, go, and, and be all that God
calls us to be. May God bless you this week.